is Casey Baker. Casey and I go way back. He was a senior when I first walked into Florida Tech. And he was sitting at this little booth, and as I walked by a registration, thinking I was going to, you know, pick the basketball player who was going to go out for the team, which I was going to be, if I made it, be sitting down all the time. He said, hey, what are you doing? Why don't you come out for rowing? I was, I was home. That was it. And that's, that, that's how people get into the sport of rowing. But since that time, Casey coached at Tech for a long time, national team rower, uh, and now is with Resolute? Resolute, yes. Right. Southeast Red. Casey so, Baker. I'm out of region, but uh, hey, welcome. Um, my topic, Jolly and how it relates to sweep, has come about um, over the years. And it really started when I started coaching sweep back uh, in, the, in the 70s when I was sculling for a national team. And what I was one of the smaller guys out there, and I certainly didn't have the erg score, so I won the sculling. And what taught me to coach my teams to a level um, beyond what they should be at, because I had small kids, Division two, was teach them a sculling stroke for sweep. And that sounds a little ludicrous, because, yeah, it's arms back slide, like Chris said, legs back, arms. But there's a feel to sculling that is not uh, necessarily translated over to sweep. And I was trying to get that feeling over to my sweep rowers. So during my nearly 20 years of sculling, or 20 years of coaching, we put men's teams in the medals, 12 out of 13 years, dad veils. I think we've had four or five appearances with my women's team in the NCAAs. Um, so we've had high levels of success. And the only thing I can attribute it to is how I taught them what I felt in sculling and tried to relate that to sweep. Inchworms, number lines, chameleons, clocks, and steam. Those are kind of my subjects. And of course, you're going, what the heck am I talking about? Um, that was why this topic, the last six years since I've been with Resolute, I've been all over the Southeast. I've been out with launches with many coaches. I would never have had that opportunity prior to this. And I've watched fall racing, fall practices with novices, uh, head races, uh, varsity programs, every different level from juniors to collegiate division one um, championship events at the NTA following launches. And I've noticed several things that to me would help people go faster. Um, and this is what I'm going to go through today. My influencers back when I was at FIT were Bill Juergens. Uh, Bill is a national team rower. He's probably the only AD in the country in college and collegiate um, ranks that was a rower and a national team rower. I was very fortunate to have that. He also was a very technical coach. And being from FIT where I went to school, um, that's kind of the way we think down there. The other guy was Bill Belden. Um, I spent 10 years rowing at Vesper Boat Club. and. Once I learned to skull in about 1975, I spent every time that I could see him watching him row, because he was a little lightweight guy, and he would kick my butt, and I was trying to figure out why. So I tried to emulate Bill Bellin as much as I could, and with him, it was his finish. That's how I uh, tried to find out how to make my boats go fast. The other guy was Gus Ignis Vesper. Gus was called the Hammer. He was uh, from John B. Kelly's time. And his main focus with us as a sculling coach was the hands. And I did as much reading as I could prior to um, this talk. And there's very little that I could find that was actually written about what the hands do inside the book. So I'm going to get into the little, the smaller aspects of sculling and what the hands do. And how can I move that over to the to understand? I would assume, I would assume that not everyone here is a sculler. Um, but if you are, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, the other guy that influences me is Mike Davenport. And I think you've heard his name around here. Uh, again, Mike and I grew up uh, in college together, and we bounced things off each other constantly from that time till now. So I use him as a sounding board and a very, very uh, positive effect on what I've done. Um, this is your proverbial inchworm. And I mentioned inchworm in the, in the early thing here. Um, there's a number line. That is what I call steam. That's, uh, he'll have a name a little bit later on, but uh, he has an important thing um, that you'll find out, and you've all talked about it here today. A clock, it's uh, like the TikTok crock in Peter Pan. It's always ticking, and you know it's coming. Um, these are chameleons. We find these down in Florida, and tough little lizards, but uh, they change colors, and that's what we have to do as rowers to make ourselves competitive and change colors. And lastly here is a vertical number line. Um, so ask these questions. Does a sculler ever let go with either hand at the recovery or catch? Well, 
The answer is this is supposed to stop, but it may keep on. Um, if, if they do, why do they, you know, why do they do? Sculptors don't. They don't let go with their hands, otherwise they flip, okay? But in watching sweep rowing, you see all the time, all the time where the rowers are letting go with their hands, especially the outside hand. And I'm thinking, why would they do that, okay? This is one of those little inchworm things. Does a sculptor let their hands slide down the grips? One centimeter, two, three centimeters? Well, no, because either one, if they do, they're going to go dead slow. Or um, if they don't, they're usually going to have a sense of uh, leverage out there. And so do sweep rowers do this? Yes, you see it all the time. I see big gaps from the end of the outside hand down the handle um, of the sweep rower on the outside hand. And I'm thinking, hmm, leverage. That's like me throwing three clams on that thing and, and deleveraging the oar. So why do they do that? Um, the number line, three centimeters, if you take one or two or three or any one of those and you slide it down the handle, you're losing leverage on that oar. And again, there's another inchworm. I'm looking at inches out here rather than feet or boat lengths to win races. Okay? And lastly, does a sculler allow their center of gravity to rise and fall two inches, four inches, six inches, or eight inches? Watching Corzo's video here earlier, on the ergometer, I was watching specifically were the rowers rising and falling inside their boat or on the erg. And if you do that in a single, what you'll see is you'll see the wakes boom, boom, boom out to the side. You'll see the stern bump, 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 which is a kiss of death in a single for speed. And so why would you want your rowers center of gravity to rise and fall excessively in a sweep boat? You don't. I have a very simple method. Um, of testing that out and getting the feedback from the rowers um, to, to let them understand what's excessive and what's not. And I believe I will, um, I'll go ahead and show that to you now. When you're on the ergometer, I usually have a room that actually has bricks in the background, so you have horizontal lines in the background. And you have a mirror there, so you set the erg up so you can see these horizontal lines behind you in the mirror and you can actually watch the line as you row, whether you're going up and down over this line, up and down over this line. And the goal here, and what I used to do as a sculler, was how do I keep myself level? How do I keep my center of gravity parallel on the erg? Rather than rising and falling, rising and falling, I'm trying to keep it absolute level because I don't want the boat bouncing. So on the erg, I would have my rowers put a yardstick next to them on the ground, and it has inch settings up here, and I would have them row back and forth on the erg this way. And I would put this stick up here where the highest point of their shoulders is. And as they rowed several strokes, I would, you know, I would find out where the high point is, and then I would find the lowest point where they hit consistently on their, on their um, drive, and even on the recovery. And what I found was most of my rowers were running six inches on this rise and fall. The center of the gravity is going up and down six inches, up and down six inches. So guess what the boat's doing? Boom, 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 like this, and you're wasting energy. So what we had them do is how can you hold your shoulders level? And you go, oh, you can't do that. If you're sitting straight up like this and you pivot, you're going to rise and fall. And you're right, you will. There's, a, there's a, 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 I guess, a limit to what's acceptable. And my limit for my team was two inches. You cannot rise and fall more than two inches, okay? And I had some six and eight inches, and, and you can see it in the boat. It's clear, but when I actually put a measurement to it, and the rowers saw that, and they were like, oh, I'm really doing that? And they're dumping their weights at the finish, and they're diving at the catch, and they're doing all this motion during the course of the drive, so the boat is getting slowed down all the time. So with the mirror and the lines behind them, they could tell how much by visually watching themselves row, whether they're rising or falling. So um, there's my vertical limber line. Oh, another inchworm. Um, so you know, you ask a couple of questions. Oops, I think we uh, skipped one here. No, we didn't. So ask a couple more questions. Are you, and I say you coaches, are your rowers adding an inch to their boat or stroke, or are they taking it away through the little things that they do? Erg length on the, uh, on the erg through arms and shoulder socket extension. I see people all the time push your arms out straight, and their arms are out straight. And I said, no, straighten it out. And it's this motion here that 
never get, okay? They'll come up to the catch and their arms are nice and straight and they're coming up and they're all of a sudden you see this boom like this and they stall their catch and they miss the water. So erg length, get the extension out here, um, and compression. In sculling, I'm comfortable at a certain level of compression, but I go a lot faster if I can get another centimeter out of my legs. And so I practice that when I'm out there on the water all the time. Is I ask them for, give me a centimeter more on your legs, because your legs are the engine. And if you're not getting the length out of your engine, you're going to go a little bit slower. You can over compress, but uh, I better keep going here. Um, are you getting your inch this practice or this day? You got to ask them every time. Are you getting your inch this race stroke? At 240 strokes in, a, in an eight, over 2,000 meters times eight people, that's 160 feet. How many boat lengths is that? That's a lot of boat lengths, okay? What if it's one person and he only gets one inch out of all his trying during that 2,000 meter race? And you got eight people that give you one inch in that 2,000 meter race and you got eight inches out of that. How many of you won and lost races by less than eight inches? Okay, everybody. Okay, and you don't like losing them. Sometimes it's a noble race, but you don't want to lose your inch. Okay, the all important inch. What to do for the inch? You need to increase technical efficiency. Okay, what we're talking about with the hands here. You need to stress the duties of the hands to get placement and control of the oar through the hands, wrists, and elbows. Okay. Piano fingers, we've all seen that. <laughs> Out to catch like this, even at the finish, where the fingers are moving around, there's piano fingers, okay? Um, the outside hand letting go. I've seen it all the time where the person mm -hmm. has two fingers on there, three fingers on there. I want, not that, I want my fingers draped around there at the finish. You know, at the catch here, like this, or at the release here, like that, and no movement of those fingers, but I see all the time the rows are out here like this. They have no control of the outside hand. That means they're trying to pull with this hand. What happened to leverage? They didn't give up an inch. They gave up a lot more than that. All right, pushing the handle beyond the outside, pushing the handle beyond outside grip with the inside hand. This is a picture out of a 1977 Oarsman magazine, and that's exactly what you see, okay? The outside hand sliding down one, two, or three centimeters. When do you say when as a coach? How much is enough? How much can you stand? I figured it out. A two centimeter loss of the outside hand, as I calculated it out with 100 pounds of force, is 1,560 foot pounds of force over 2,000 meters. Add that up. That's a lot of lost effort. The number line, again, comes down to that. Stress the use of the feet mm. for balance. Mm. Most people only use the oars for balance. You need the feet for balance as well. The initial draw, or even draw, using the kneecaps, not the legs. People think, oh, draw the legs. The legs are too big. You can't think of it. You have to think of something small. Draw the kneecaps, OK? Weightless feet in the shoes on the recovery. I just picked up a book in Mike's office the other day. It was Fairburn. What is it, the, uh, the, the Fairburn book on rowing? And I open it up, and boom, I'm looking right at this thing. He's talking about weightless feet in the foot stretchers. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's all my talk. So Steve Fairburn, in his book, talks about that. The toes drawn gently back to level the boat. I use it all the time in sweep rowing when they're trying to balance the boat and they're going like this and they're shifting their weight around. I said, starboards, pull your toes back. And they'll pull the toes back and then the boat will start to move. I said, ah, did it. And they just have to know when to let go. So use the toes to level the boat. Gimbaled erg, I put this up here because two years ago I tried one of the ergs um, at uh, Masters and I put on the lowest setting, this thing swivels back and forth, and I think, I'm a sculler, I can handle this, and I tell you what, it was a real bear. And the least little misdirection of my eyes, I went off balance, and it was showed me how important it is to stay focused and not move around. And I'm gonna run out of time here. Time with your athletes. There's my clock, tick tock croc. All right, coach needs hands on to get their hands right. That means you need to spend time with your individual athlete. One-on-one, -on, -one. on the erg, talking about center of gravity, linked at the catch, linked at the finish too. Um, in the tanks, if you have tanks, in a barge, if you have a barge, those are critical, critical areas where you can get the hands right and not have to coach from the boat, the launch, and you have to describe it to them. 
time and pressure, I'm under that now. So here comes uh, not enough time to get them ready. The, tick, the clock is ticking. You look at your calendar like, oh gosh, races in two weeks. I can't fix this. Forget it. I can get more out of it with training. We're not even going to look at technique. You guys just row harder, OK? So that's what we think. Forget tech, must train, race is coming. We'll fix that later. I don't have time. You'll never fix it later. And then it's Charlie Brown. Ah! OK? There's Peter Pressure. Suddenly, your steam's coming out of your ears. The clock's ticking. You don't have time to do all this. You're a high school coach. You got jobs. You got family. You got a little bit of everything. And you think, where's the easy button? You know, boom, I want it to work, and I want them to go fast, and you're, and, and you're out of time. OK? What do we coaches do? We prioritize due to time limitations. We give up technical detail time for training. You got to get home, go to work. You got family, jobs. You don't have any time to spare. You can't rig because you don't have time. You don't have time to spend one-on-one -on -one with your athletes five minutes or 15 or any time. And so what are you doing? You're losing those inches. Races are coming soon. Deadlines, no time. Um, OK, workouts have to be done. We have to get faster. So you get frantic. And the, and the, and the athletes can tell that sometimes. So uh, you gravitate towards raising the rating to get faster or try and get more training in. And the small tech seems to say it's too small to worry about, so you bypass it. We trade technical inches for training inches and hope the trade is enough. And you never know if you don't do the tech inches. You don't know. The number lines. I use the analogy of a number line in a one inch box. Um, the number line is a line that's out in front of you. The catch being one end of the line and the finish being the other end of the line. And there's an infinite number of dots along the line. And the one inch box is that last little bit of the line right here at the finish. I always taught my rowers to support a one inch box of support in here. And that starts from the catch, and they do this long, skinny line that finishes one inch higher in here, because almost everyone pulls down to the lap. Okay? And the rise and fall, the center of gravity, we talked about that. I showed you what that was. How much do you allow rise and fall? And the light switch. The light switch is at the release here, when you're following your number line on the drive and you're bending, bending, bending back to this thing and you get that last dot of the drive, then Boom, that light switch goes off and all the power stops. And at that instant, that blade is still bent. Okay? And you have enough time to tap it out of the water without power. The blade comes out and sends the boat and you come away and you have a perfect finish. And that's what I saw Bill Belden do. Okay? Power on, power off. Forget it. I'm moving on. Four levels of competency. Unconscious, incompetent. Looks easy. Yeah, huh? That's your novices or the people who see it for the first time. Has no dots on his number line. The conscious competent is the novice. He has three, legs, arm, and back. Varsity rowers have about 10 to 15 points of reference. And elite rowers, oh, look, Ma, I can row. Unconscious com competent is elite rowers. They have 30 or more. All right, Mike. Hi, Casey. This is blinking. All right. You know, every single rower that No, I'm not, but I'm going to get out of here. OK, good. All right. Um, one minute, one minute, Casey. Question. Who's got a question? I'm, I missed the chameleon, and that's the main point of it, is you have to, the reason about the hands is you've got to be able to adjust to new coaches, new techniques, and new rowers. I, I want to ask about the thing on the back. Yes. Center of gravity. I look at their heart. I look at their, well, I, the, hearts, the hearts and shoulders are attached, so I kind of measure the shoulders. But my sense is this is your center of gravity, and so I tend to reference this, your heart. Yeah. Not the shoulders. Okay. All right. Sorry, I couldn't finish.